so before we get the, the first slide up, I'm just wondering, how did we all go with our gratitude practice? Did we, did we give it a go? And what were some, did anybody sort of notice any sort of, begin noticing anything different throughout the week? Okay, does anyone feel like sharing anything? Just for the people who weren't here last week and didn't get the homework, it was, it was gratitude practice recounting three things that went well in your day and a little bit digging deeper down to sort of explore some of those sorts of feelings around those things. So, any comments or feedback? Yes. I found that the web was much better. How about that? So we're talking about three things a day. Okay, any, anyone else got any other feedback? It's always, it's always great to remember the good things that you experience because they make you feel good. So when you recount them, you're actually putting good endorphins into your system. Well, I think that you should take centre stage. <laughs> <laughs> Absolutely. So this isn't something that I'm going to be encouraging. Okay, listen, you've done it for a week. That's it. This is essentially a lifetime practice I would love for you to adopt. And what that essentially does is, and it's something we're going to be going into um, more depth tonight, is we're growing the good. We are actually growing our capacity to see all of the good things that are in our life rather than focus on the things that aren't necessarily, um, you know, or, or things we take for granted. And um, I think we can move to the first slide now. Um, the other thing um, we did last week, and it was a bit rushed, um, was the positivity ratio. And again, this is something I would really recommend if you weren't here last week, that you hop online, look up um, Fredrickson, um, Barbara Fredrickson's positivity ratio. Now, I did say that positivity ratio, it's not an exact science. It is something that you gives you a picture of, of your day that has been. So how many positive things for how many negative things. And they sort of say that it's best to have a ratio of at least three to one, but these ratios change. They're a bit adaptable because if we're talking about a marriage, if it's only three to one, not looking too good. You probably want to aim for about five positive to one negative, and I will explain why further into this talk. So this is a lot. I feel like I should be like presenting a, a Talmudic tale, but this isn't a Talmudic tale. This is a Cherokee tale. And it's the story of two wolves. One evening, an old Cherokee told his grandson about a battle that goes on between inside people. He said, my son, the battle is between two wolves. In sorry. The battle is between two wolves inside us all. One is evil, i.e. negativity. It's anger, envy, jealousy, sorrow, regret, greed, arrogance, Self-pity, guilt, resentment, inferiority, lies, false pride, superiority and ego. The other is good. It is joy, peace, love, hope, serenity, humility, kindness, benevolence, empathy, generosity, truth, compassion and faith. The grandson thought for a moment or so and then he turned to his grandfather and he said, well, which wolf wins? And the grandfather replies, whichever one you feed. So that is a really important life lesson. What we place our attention on, it's what I said last week, what we focus on, that's what grows. If we practice anger, resentment, all of these things, we get really good at it. If we practice these other things, we also get really good at that. So that's what we're aiming for. So how do we actually build a more positive brain. Does anybody here sort of, um, sort of have, have you sort of met any disenchanted or unhappy millionaires in your lifetime? Yeah. yeah. Because so, so it says something that, you know, it's not all about money. One of the most unhappy people I know, he's, I won't even get, begin to go there, but, you know, he has got multi-millions behind him. So essentially, we can adapt to anything, good or bad. We essentially return back to our set point. What I would love to encourage um, everybody here is to just be open to the idea that actually we can nudge this set point just a little bit more towards positivity. And the way we do that is through repetitive practice, like gratitude practice. 
you know, neurons that fire together, wire together. So that is something um, that we really need to um, take, make attention to. So how, the, the reality is, is that negative actually has a stronger charge than positive. Now, that's, you know, just, it's, it's actually designed because of how we have, you know, it's a survival mechanism. If, for example, you know, as, as, a, as a baby or something, you didn't learn really, really quickly when that hot stove is on to sort of, you know, withdraw, there'd be a lot more accidents. So our brain is essentially hardwired for negativity. It's a survival mechanism. That's just how it is. So that can make us feel really stressed even when there are lots of positive things. So the positive things don't necessarily have as much of a, a depth of sort of imprint on the brain. And the brain is really good at building brain structure from negative experiences, as I said. And it's relatively poor at building it from positive experiences. They seem to be more transitory. It's like, yeah, that was nice. Yeah, let's move on. Oh, boy, that looks like a dangerous road. Better be, 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 be careful. So I really like this, and I think it's a, it's a fabulous um, analogy um, coined by Dr Rick Hansen, who's a, a neuropsychologist. Um, and essentially, he's coined the term Velcro for the bad and Teflon for the good. So I presume people know what Teflon is, and I presume people know what Velcro is. Yeah. So we have to actually be mindful that that's what's essentially happening in the brain, okay? Velcro for the bad and Teflon for the good. So we need to essentially have strategies to grow the good, to change the brain structure. So this is where the challenge comes. Because positive experiences use standard memory systems. So they move from short-term buffers to long-term storage. And to move from a short-term buffer to a long-term storage is an experience that actually needs to be held in that short-term buffer long enough for it to convert to long-term storage. I can't remember the name of that fabulous, um, you know, that animated film, you know, with the, with the, um, the little girl that has all of these um, emotions anyway. It's a bit like that. She has all these different things that are moving along the, the thing. So we actually need to get to a point where rather than just let these things just sort of brush us by and, you know, just that whole Teflon experience, how do we actually pause and absorb these experiences so they actually go into that long-term storage? How do we actually change our brain structure? Pausing and absorbing, really, really important. Um, I want to just introduce a, a way of also looking at is, generally speaking, we lead our lives from a position of unconscious incompetence, so doing things not particularly well without thinking about it. Then, when we get introduced to new concepts, it actually moves to conscious incompetence. It's like, oh, yeah, I was going to be doing it, you know, going to be, you know, whatever it is, but oh, just totally forgot. Then we actually have to move to, I have to get just think, um, <laughs> conscious competence, okay? And we actually want to shift all the way over to unconscious competence. So that basically doing like the really competent things unconsciously, just like we would do the non-competent things unconsciously. So what essentially you can see is it's a process. It's not like one day you're just going to wake up and say, right, I'm going to become the most grateful person in the whole wide world and today's the day I'm going to do it and then you don't repeat that, you know, that mantra the next day. It's every, it's every day repetitive things. It's, it's how our brains work, the theory of change. It doesn't happen overnight. So a lot of, um, for example, in my coaching clients, one of the first things I ask them to do is if they wear a wristwatch on their left hand, I challenge them for the next six weeks to wear their wristwatch on their right hand. And it's a really fascinating way of actually using a physical marker of how our brain actually can change. So initially you're sort of feeling really uncomfortable, you're not thinking um, that, you, you know, it's like, oh, you might, you might forget. Um, and then over time, it's like you'll all of a sudden reach for your wristwatch and place it on your right wrist if you were left-handed, etc. So it is a process, but it does happen. 
So one of the things um, that we're going to be looking at today um, and the, the character strengths that um, Label mentions is actually going to be the focus more of your homework because it's a fabulous online tool. Um, this is something, endorphins. Um, some of you may have heard me talk about endorphins before and that's because they are fabulous. They are worth talking about. They are our body's endogenous morphine. So they're not just about this sort of touchy-feely, yeah, yeah, something, you know, feels good. It's actually they're changing our physiology. So um, in the remaining um, few minutes... Just, just explain that generally speaking, there are six categories of endorphin boosters that each and every one of you have, okay? Now, the thing is, we don't tend to really pause and absorb into these things. We don't tend to notice these things. What I want you to, what I challenge you to do from now and here on is to in whatever way that you would like to, whether it is taking a photo of this or making up a little... Um, table, there are essentially six categories of endorphin boosters. And um, the great thing about um, these things is they don't necessarily have to be real. They can be your visual imaginings. It has the same effect on the brain. So places that you love, you don't have to have visited them. People, pets or animals that you, you really like. You know, you don't have to personally know Tom Cruise or whoever it is. Um, activities that make you feel good, happy or complete. Peak experiences, so moments when you've really felt extraordinarily at ease with the world. Religious and spiritual figures, well, I think we're spoilt for choice here, um, that evoke a feeling of warmth, a smile, you know, of inspiration. And in their own right... Textures, scents, sounds, tastes and colours. You know, there's been research done in Denmark about the well-being benefits of vanilla scented candles. So, you know, there are some textures that, you know, or colours, you know, someone's got their feature wall because it's their happy room. It makes them feel good. So what I thought we might do is, just so you understand that this can be, it's, it's meant to be tailored to you, Let's just do a little bit of a brainstorm about what sort of things really make you smile. What things warm your heart? What things make you feel that all is well in your world? So they can be, as I say, places, people, activities, peak experiences, religious, spiritual, etc. And hopefully we're not going to go squeaking. And just in case you can't see, rather than bullet points, we have smiley faces. Let's go. Grandchildren. Grandchildren. Pets. Pets. Okay, keep shouting them out. Music, flowers. Music, flowers. Chocolate. <laughs> um, Art. Sun. Sunshine. TV. Spouses. Spouses. Holidays. Holidays. Children. Children. Perfume. Perfume, was it? Girlfriends. Creativity. Creativity. No, we don't. They get a, they get a sad face. Um, sorry? Pardon? A greeting. Greeting from someone. That's lovely. Okay, gardening. Exercise. Fishing. Movies. Smells. Smells, good ones I'm assuming. Flowers. Flowers we have. <laughs> Pardon? <laughs> Food. Food. Okay. Couple last ones. Holidays. Holidays we've got. Sunsets. Friendships. Sunsets. Beautiful. Sorry for my scroll, but I'm under time thing I so what we essentially have here is a really diverse list and what you might speak to you, like if someone's got an allergy to perfume or a lactose intolerance to chocolate, it's not going to like, you know, boost their endorphins. It's actually about finding things and really not just, as I say, not being casual about your attachment or how these make you feel, but actually sensing into them really on a daily basis. Get in touch with your endorphins, grow your endorphins and over time I can guarantee you, you will, oh look, even, even my time has gone off. I ha um, 
over time, that is going to lead to greater well-being and happiness. And the last slide is really just in terms of the homework. I want you to do this um, VIA character strength survey. And we're going to have a bit of a recap about some of your strengths. Again, we're building positivity. So thank you so much. Thank you.